welcome uh, Dr. Fruchter and the class to London, to East London, where we're based here. Um, this is a image of the crystal on a sunny day. <laughs> um, and yeah, let's get into it. So, so briefly what we'll cover, uh, initially we'll see what is the crystal, um, what is it used for, why is it so sustainable, um, what goes on here. And then uh, after that we go into the specific technologies involved um, within the crystal. And then to answer one of the questions that you raised uh, in the email was what are some of the limitations and some of the frequently asked questions we have. And then um, my favorite part sort of of why we do all of this in general is how buildings should be, how, how buildings would look like in a city of the future. So let's get into it. I hope you were able to hear the sort of dramatic music there. <laughs> it did come through. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so, um, why why does the crystal exist? Um, it was built in 2012 by Siemens uh, as a showcase for um, sustainable cities and what that looked like. So, how we can explore the cities of tomorrow. Um, so as you saw in the video, there's a, you know, there's an exhibition on the future of cities, but then also we host a lot of events. Um, it's open for any, for any uh, you know, organization that wants to hold an event, but the focus is on sustainability topics. So we have our uh, Siemens Center of Global, uh, sorry, Global Center of Competence for Cities. And here we look at all the research that is uh, so we research all the work that's being done within cities around the world. So this is so as you can see here a center to discuss and learn about challenges the cities are facing, and then solutions to reduce the environmental impact. And then it's a home for thought leadership on urban sustainability, providing experts to exchange ideas through the events we mentioned. Um, so yeah, this is specifically what it's used for. So it's a home to the world's largest exhibition focused on urban sustainability, uh, a conference center for businesses, public institutions, and green enthusiasts. And as I mentioned, the home to Siemens' global center of competence for cities. And 
uh, showcase for Siemens technologies, which we'll go into as we, uh, further on. So why did Siemens create this, uh, the Crystal Building? Um, as you know, a lot of the countries and companies around the world aim to be net carbon neutral. They have different targets. And so uh, this is Siemens' aim by 2030 to be net carbon neutral. And so there are various programs and initiatives in place throughout the company, while here in the crystal, it's sort of a combination of all these things. So energy efficiency, uh, distributed energy systems, and then um, in the parking lot, we have electric vehicle charging with a Tesla uh, supercharger, and all this is powered by renewable and green energy. So the building, uh, a little overview on top, um, is divided into two parts. One is the exhibition space, and the other is the event space and office space. So where we have the auditorium, which fits, uh, with, uh, which has 270 seats, and then uh, our office space for waste, and then also various meeting rooms. So why is it one of the most sustainable buildings in the world? Um, because it was awarded the LEED Platinum and BREEAM Outstanding um, Awards. LEED is based in the US and BREEAM is uh, based in the UK. And so, it, um, as you can see, 42% improved energy efficiency and 71% less CO2 emissions. So to go further into detail, what these two certifications uh, mean. So on top we see the LEED. Um, this is issued by the US Green Building Council and the Crystal Building achieved 86 out of a possible 109 points. Um, oh, sorry, I'm missing here the, sorry, the, <laughs> I must have accidentally taken it out. But, um, well, slightly under the possible available points um, in these various categories from sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy, materials used, the indoor quality, environmental quality, and then the innovation and design and the regional priority. And uh, similarly for Priam, uh, how our points have been divided across similar categories. Oh, never mind, there they are. <laughs> Oops. You can see we have uh, energy efficient lighting here. <laughs> okay. So, um, one of the questions that we are asked, how does this compare to regular or standard buildings of the same size and capacity? So, um, 42 or almost 43% energy consumption, less energy consumption than a standard building. Um, this is achieved through triple glazing of windows, uh, air tightness of you know the insulation, um, how the building is oriented, which plays a, a good, a very uh, interesting part in terms of how wind, how how wind uh, influences um, the energy, and then. Um, you know, depending on how it's oriented, you have natural ventilation um, and other technologies than sort of under floor heating, chilled beams, low velocity air displacement, demand control, ventilation and lighting and energy monitoring. And we'll go into these specifically. And then also it has a 71% greenhouse gas, less greenhouse gas emissions than a standard building. Um, through the various renew renewable energy sources such as ground source heat pumps, photovoltaic panels, and solar thermal panels. So this is a little infographic overview of the various technologies going on in the building. Um, so if we start on top, we have the solar therm thermal panels, the photovoltaic panels, and then going inside the building, of course, LED lighting, um, and then how this all this uh, is measured through 
uh, this building automation software. And then moving underneath, we have the chilled beams. Um, I have a question. Can you see my mouse here? Maybe it's easier if I point. Yes, I can. Okay, okay. So chilled beams uh, that, and uh, heating that come from uh, underground thermal storage. Um, so they are 150, uh, 50, 150 meter bores. Uh, boreholes, sorry, and there's 36 of them, which um, contribute to the thermal energy. Um, and then in terms of water, uh, they, the building uh, harvests rainwater and also recycles black water. And that's about it. I mentioned that not natural ventilation. And then, um, so, well, I'll get into this wind turbine uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a later slide. So how does this building compare to uh, buildings worldwide? So this shows that the, in orange that the crystal building is the so, sort of only one that has achieved lead platinum and bream outstanding. And this is as of 2012 when it was uh, uh, open, compared to various other sustainable buildings uh, around the world which have sort of lower um, certification ratings. So as I mentioned, we have a various events and host various uh, openings over here. And I'm sure you all recognize the man in the picture. Um, from a company not too far away from campus. And, and then there's also an exhibition on the future of cities. Um, yeah. So um, this just shows, if you're familiar with London, it's in the east side of London, just even more east of Canary Wharf, uh, which is a major financial district. And so it's one, it was built in 2012 as part of a new re regeneration of the area. So some go into the technology of the building and here are some of the key features as I mentioned. Um, solar thermal arrays, ground source heat pumps, photovoltaic cells, chilled beams, heat recovery, lighting or smart lighting, building management systems, green building monitors, and various passive measures uh, in terms of how the building facade is set up and the ventilation involved. And as, this, as we saw before, it was an all electric building. So why is it intelligent? Um, all, of the, all of the technologies produce data, and there is a Siemens building automation system which garners 3,500 data points. Um, our building management station is called Desigo CC, and we have various technologies that are integrated into it, whether it be fire systems or security systems. Um, so that's, that's what we call an intelligent building. Um, and then going further into this, how is it integrated into the, all the renewable energies evolved in our in, in the building and so the same software can detect and keep um, sort of keep track of the lighting the, the energy demand the water and the heating and so on so in terms of electricity uh, the building is 100% electric and doesn't use any fossil fuels um, 20% of our electricity comes from the photovoltaic panels on the roof and the rest, so 80%, comes from the UK power network, which um, is, we buy off a green, sorry, a green tariff. Um, and so the annual consumption is uh, approximately 1,467 megawatts per hour. And so in terms of photovoltaic panels, this is one of the passive measures. 
how the building facade, it, uh, so, so how, to, how the building is oriented depending on differences in the sun's um, you know, position throughout the day. So you can see here that the high proportion of glass is required on the east facade to take advantage of the low east sun for heating in winter. But in the summer, air temperatures are lower, so less cooling energy um, it is required. So speaking of heating and cooling, um, underneath the building there are there's a ground there's two ground source heat pumps which are connected to the pipe network and they provide 100% of our heating and cooling. Um, so the low energy distribution systems uh, come from the chilled beams, underfloor heating, and low velocity air displacement. And the energy recovery system uh, is powered by a thermal wheel and a natural ventilation system. So here you can see the, the, the divide between electrical energy and thermal energy. Um, as I said, we have, so from the photovoltaic, that gives, uh, from the photovoltaic gives about 10% of electrical energy and 50% comes from the main, so the, the UK power network. And then uh, in terms of, so sorry, so that powers appliances throughout the building and the light. Whereas the thermal energy, um, a very small amount comes from solar and and uh, almost 40% comes from the ground source. Um, sorry. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so, in terms of lighting, the building is filled with, uh, as you saw in the pictures, very uh, glass, so which gives a lot of natural light. Um, but that also gives a lot of um, sort of through the triple glazing of the glass gives very good insulation in the winter time, and um, it's strategically placed glazing so that throughout the day uh, you know you can get the most optimal um, use of lighting, natural lighting, and so. All of these, all of these measures are all of these uh, sort of data points also connected to our uh, operating center within the building, which monitors consumption and, and identifies places to improve. Um, and yeah, basically, it's also done by us in the building and uh, an external um, monitor. So for water, um, as you know, in London, in the UK, there's a lot of rain. So how's the best way to make the most of this resource? Um, you know, as it comes down, it, where we harvest, we treat the rainwater, and then it's used uh, both for potable and um, for potable water, and then which goes into black water, and then it can be recycled and then reused. Uh, for various sources, whether that be, um, you know, in the bathrooms or um, in the gardens around the building, and so on. So, just a little overview of the various technologies that I mentioned: the PV uh, on top of the building, and this is the underground ground source heat pumps the exhibition air handling units. So these are um, sort of behind the scenes of the large exhibition. Um, this is within the uh, one part of the office that provides the cooling and uh, during the summer months. And also we get some ventilation from, uh, from the wind around the building as well. And uh, this is the uh, rainwater tank that is underneath the building, uh, sorry, underneath the building that harvests the rainwater. 
Um, this gives a little bit of an overview of the various technologies found, whether that be building automation systems or fire safety systems and security systems. So, and so some of the limitations at the moment, because every building can be improved. Um, so some of the current in, uh, limitations which could become opportunities for future innovation. The first is that the electricity consumption of the exhibition is very, very uh, large because most of the screens and displays are almost constantly on. And so one solution would be to use media players instead of servers to power the to power the inf information displayed. Secondly, the server rooms. So how is the thermal design, uh, so how, how, how is their ther thermal heating design? So currently, of course, it's being cooled, but it's just sort of spread all around, which is not that efficient. So the better option would be to target the cooling. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. The better option would be to target the cooling directly at the sort of at the servers. And then as you can see in the picture, as this is being cooled, the heat would be, you know, releasing from the room or being, you know, removed it to the outside. So what could be a better way is to recover this heat to be used for offices and meeting rooms. So some of the frequently asked questions we get about the building is how long did it take to build? And that is, so it was 12 months of planning and 18 months of construction. Um, secondly, so on that point about uh, the wind turbines that you saw in the, in the infographic, so it's not directly powered by the wind turbines, but you can see in this picture, this is the London uh, Wind Array Farm which is 20 miles east of here, uh, approximately 20 miles. And that is powered to the UK grid. And so indirectly, we do get power from that. And uh, funnily, I mean, interestingly enough, the wind turbines in the London array are produced by Siemens. So indirectly, we do get powered by wind, wind turbines. And um, also, with all this, all these various sources of energy, is there a battery storage on site? At the moment, there is not. Um, that's because there, the building is sort of always using the energy, um, and there's no, there's not really a business case at the moment to have a battery on site. So this shows a little time lapse of how the building was built. We're at fine, just in time. Okay, okay. So this is the last part. So why? So in general, what's the the purpose of having the smart building? And in general, where where are we headed in terms of all this smartness in our in our devices? 
So this is all producing data in the end. And so how is that sort of driving the digital revolution? And so all of these uh, can be incorporated into um, the Internet of Things. And so here we're looking at um, what, what all this can benefit us with with efficiency, productivity, capacity, shorter time to market, resilience, and flexibility. And so in smart cities here specifically. And so what incorporates a smart city? So becoming smart just um, improves on a city's competitiveness in terms of getting business and new uh, citizens and, and so on, better livability. So the efficient transport of people and goods, reliable and efficient supply of energy, low emissions, water usage and waste, comfort, quality of life and security. So the city of the future has various ways to manage data. And so this is, um, this all creates a new sort of value for the city through various building uh, technologies, energy systems and mobility. So speaking of buildings, um, as we mentioned in the in the crystal, we have all of these buildings. Uh, all sorry, all of these uh, components uh, in, in the building. So some of the benefits include integration of lighting, cooling, and security into one platform, reduction of energy consumption and costs, um, protection of fires and general security. There is mobility. Um, so going away from the building, going on onto the outdoors, the street. So how can that become smarter? And so these are, as you can see across the board, various um, technologies and solutions that we also work on. This, as you know, reduces congestion, maximizes the capacity of, of our infrastructure, provides real-time traffic information, and improves safety and attractiveness. Um, here we go into the power grid. And so how in the future will we get our energy from various sources? And what does that mean for a distributed energy network um, in terms of consumers becoming prosumers, so, so we can sell uh, back to the grid sort of on energy that we produce. So some of the benefits are reliable, reliability, uh, grid transparency, uh, allowing us to get energy from multiple sources and protecting critical infrastructure. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dean. Uh, this is always great to learn about such inspiring projects and buildings that are real, not just the vision. Mm -hmm.